really excited about this panel. Uh, yeah, we have a great group of folks here to talk about sort of the harsh realities we're all facing. It's a, obviously in a downturn. Um, what I thought I'd do is take a first couple minutes to go through a couple slides, maybe setting the stage for what we're seeing in the market. Um, you know, I'm John Norris with HSBC Innovation Banking, a brand new division of HSBC. A uh, group of us from SVB left and are doing our own thing there, a sort of high touch commercial banking venture debt, so happy to talk about that. But first, let's go through a couple slides and sort of set the stage for some of the harsh reality talk uh, we're talking about. Um, and again, the, you know, this paper is on my LinkedIn as well as HSBC Innovation Bank. It's like 70 pages long, but we're going to just look at a couple slides here. Uh, so, so the first slide sort of looks at overall investment into healthcare, venture-backed companies in the U.S. and Europe. I think a couple takeaways, 50% down from 2021, 28% from 2022, but ahead of, you know, 20, 2019. And I think, you know, obviously, yeah, there's, there's a couple things at work here when you see less dollars coming in. One, a lot more inside rounds, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then two, you know, the big mezzanine rounds to, to public IPOs that we saw in 2021 has, has largely kind of faded away. Um, uh, specifically, when you think about med tech, uh, a couple things. One, if you think med tech tends to be more of a steady eddy area. So actually the investment in med tech has not had as big a significantly as a decline as we've seen in the other sectors. So only down about 19% since 2022, actually up since 2020. Um, so from that perspective, the amount of capital that's actually going into the sector is pretty good. And I think, you know, there's not as, as crazy uh, step ups as we saw in other sectors. So there's not as, as much to, to, to fall when you sort of recalibrate in a, a little bit of a slower uh, marketplace. And by indication, you know, definitely seeing more activity in neuro, you know, neurostim, brain computer interface, a lot of imaging, specifically in oncology, you know, less non-invasive monitoring. I think that was something that got a lot of headway in 2020, 2021, some nice exits there. I think a lot of people have placed some, some big bets there. So a lot of capital in, so we're not seeing as much investment right now. I think cardiovascular is pretty stable, but on the early stage side, not seeing as much Series A activity in that area. And you know, this one I wanted to just uh, really focus on for a little bit, saying you know, insider rounds have been prevalent in 2023. And inside rounds really defined as you know, a insider's passing the hat, either you're bringing in maybe one new investor doing a small round, or you're passing the hat on the existing investors and doing a smaller round than you would have done otherwise. And why is this happening? Really, it's a function of milestones moving, as well as a slower pace of, of investors. You know, folks are taking their time, making new investments, and milestones that had, you know, previously unearthed a new round with a, with a step up have been changed. You know, in down cycles, those milestones get pushed out, people asking for you to do more to, to, to actually get to that new round. But on that same note, we do see a number of step ups that we saw in 2023. There were 50 deals that we saw leveraging PitchBook data where there was actually a new investor coming in and stepped up from the post of the last round to the pre of the new round. Um, but what we're seeing here in device, I think, which is uh, I think a leading um, you know, a precursor to the other sectors is you're starting to see in series B and later these valuation resets. So, you know, got ahead of ourselves in 2021, the comps were bigger, bigger valuations. Now we're seeing, you know, new investor-led deals that are re-resetting the valuation. And I think that's good. And that's, that's a part of the, the, the cycle. And we saw one in three where we actually had the data to calculate the step, step up or down. One in three Series B or later deals were step downs. Um, but again, still seeing good activity. And if you look at private rounds based on post-money valuations, you know, a couple things come, come to light. One, you know, later stage deals, a lot more commercial stage, but instead of seeing, you know, growth investors and private equity folks who are coming in, uh, leading these late stage rounds, you're seeing tr more traditional venture. Um, and that's sort of the good news, because the bigger venture rounds that are venture investors that are focused on med tech have new capital that they've raised over the last two years. So they do have capital to sort of put into play. So with that as sort of an overview, you know, yes, we're seeing more inside rounds. Yes, you know, there are some step ups, uh, but, you know, maybe flat is the new up. You know, the idea, let's, let's get into to talking to, you know, this amazing panel and get into sort of where the harsh realities are and, and how to navigate them. 
So with that, maybe we'll, we'll just uh, cut the, the, uh, the slide deck, and then we'll start with some introductions, starting with Anita. Um, I'm Anita Watkins. I'm the managing director for Rex Health Ventures. We're the corporate venture arm for UNC Healthcare based in North Carolina. Um, we invest across the entire healthcare spectrum, um, particularly love med tech, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. My name is Daniel Hawkins. I have been in the uh, med tech space about 30 years, so I've seen a couple of cycles. Uh, and this is my ninth startup that I'm involved in right now, and it's in the AI space for managing uh, high-quality images using MR. I've uh, been in robotics and vascular, and most recently a company called Avail, which will be part of the topic today on harshest of harsh realities. Um, my name is Sean Chain. Uh, I'm a managing director at Ascension Ventures and uh, head of uh, med tech and life sciences practice there. Uh, we are a uh, multi-health system strategic fund. Uh, Ascension's our largest LP. Uh, we also invest on behalf of 12 others, including Intermountain, Advent Health, uh, really mid to large size IDNs uh, that pull the capital together uh, and invest in anything that really touches US health systems and hospitals. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, the unpanel and uh, therapy session. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, Omid Akhavan, uh, I lead Anthro Ventures. Um, we're a family office uh, based out of DC, um, investing mainly in clinical through commercial stage med tech. Um, started my career in management consulting, did strategy business development, uh, Fortune 500 company, went into investing and been doing that. But now I'm also the CEO of one of my portfolio companies, um, which is another harsh reality that I'm living <laughs> as an investor. Awesome, so again, you know, great, panel for this discussion topic, which is a hard one. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions, and we'll let sort of the panel sort of jump in. And maybe for this first question, Daniel, we're going to keep you at last, because I'm going to ask like sort of a follow-up question, let you get into this. But first question is on pivoting, right? And so, you know, let's talk a little bit about lessons learned. You know, when you think about, you know, where you have a company where product market fit isn't quite right or sales channels not working or, you know, things of that nature. And maybe we'll, we'll save the sort of discussion on how macroeconomic trends sort of impact your, your pivot to, to Daniel. And then we'll, we'll riff off of that as well. But Anita, you want to get started with this? Sure. Um, and, and I think what I'd like to focus on is not pivoting too soon. Um, the reality of today's market, especially for companies that are selling into health systems, is that margins are razor thin. And those decision-making processes are taking longer and longer. And we're going to talk about cash management uh, as well. But I think making sure that you don't panic as a company and say, oh, perhaps product market fit's not there. Um, you know, that's why we're not getting the contract across the line. I think really doing that customer discovery and understanding what's going on, and that's why having investors like Sean and I around the table can really help you understand what's going on within the market. I can't tell you how many times I'm cooking dinner and one of my CEOs calls and says, we've got three hospitals that just won't sign. What's going on? What are you seeing in your health system? What, um, you know, do you think that could be going on here? And that's something you've got to understand. And again, just not panic. But understanding product market fit way early in the process is absolutely critical. Again, having investors like us that can connect you with the end users, can connect you with, with the health systems to understand, does this fit workflow? If it doesn't fit workflow, you're not going to sell. Um, if it doesn't fit the actual need that you're trying to address, the, the physician's not willing to change their current procedure, even if it's the best idea. I'm one of our companies that failed. Incredible product, but the pr procedure that's currently being done, um, the physicians would just not pivot. It's a very complicated procedure. They, turned a, they spent a very long time training to do that procedure. Um, and to get them to change gears um, once they became really good at that procedure is really, really hard to do. So understanding all that on the front end is absolutely critical. Yeah. Sean, you want to join in on this? Yeah, I completely agree with them, what, what Nita's saying. And I'll, I'll say that the, um, you know, I think in the past we've had decades of uh, health system thinking where the clinicians really pounded the table and you had a champion in there and then you got your device or product through <laughs> Um, and there was really no accounting at the, you know, certainly practice level, uh, but even at the hospital level or even the health system level. Uh, and there was a number of procedures where, it, you know, 
we see as negative contribution margin. Uh, so every time you do a procedure, uh, because the ASP of a specific device or a catheter or product ends up, uh, you know, with your reimbursements in a negative side, so the health system is losing money rolled up, but there was no accounting of it, and so you couldn't really track it. And I think many med tech companies had, you know, great revenue because of that at the expense of these uh, hospitals. And they're now getting smarter, I would say, in the last five years, uh, becoming more aware of contribution margin uh, at the procedure level. And so what we see now looking forwards is, um, you know, uh, uh, two really you know, major trends. One is the group purchasing offices are working with the, um, uh, you know, the service line leads to say, well, do we need that premium product when we can sort of buy this, you know, slightly less one, or if there's only one out there, what can we invest in, uh, you know, through the Accenture Venture side uh, to really, you know, create more competition in the market. Um, so I think that's all to say the the, the landscape's changed a little bit. Um, it's not to say it's always about the the cost side of things uh, for health systems, but the voice around uh, you know contribution margins becoming more more um, uh, you know apparent. And I would say you know, how that what that has to do with you know pivoting is um, you 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 may assume a certain ASP going out to it and your TAM is that big. Uh, you know I think those need to be down adjusted. And I would say oftentimes you know sitting on the investor side, um, you know the the pivot is not hard, but the fact that you have, you know, four, five, six board members, uh, you're a CEO there, um, and then it is a differential equation of do you adjust the price, do you kind of change the, you know, population, do you, um, you know, adjust the device? It becomes a very complex conversation to be had. So even if you knew the answer, you know, it's hard to kind of veer your board towards that. And so I think it's a, it's a very nuanced art uh, to do that, and um, you know, we're as board members, we're all open to be convinced, but it, it needs a little bit of education as well. So, can I? I so, so I, I know they've they've talked a lot about the commercial side of pivoting. I know a lot. I assume a lot of the audience is kind of in that building a technology, getting through clinical trials, trying to get a product to market. And I think as you think about building a med tech startup, you go through multiple you know, reincarnations as a company, right? It's, it's never a smooth journey. You start with a great idea, a vision that you're going to change the world. And you begin this journey with some very generally inspirational physician advisors who are encouraging you. And then you go and you start meeting investors at a conference like this and you get a hundred no's and you're kind of discouraged. You know, then finally you get your break. Somebody gives you that seed check and you're like, yes, I'm going to, you know, now I can buy the supplies I need to make to the next step of the journey. And what I find really interesting about building a med tech startup, unlike technology startups, there are so many points at which, you know, the winds can blow in a direction that derails you. So whether it's the FDA, whether it's reimbursement, whether it is access to capital, whether it is your device failing on the bench or in an animal study or, you know, um, being delayed because of COVID, your, you know, access to your clinical trial is pushed out 18 months because you can't get through contracting at a site. And so I think, you know, the big question around when do you make a pivot, right? What do you do comes down to the reality of what is happening around you in your um, specific subsector and for you as a company, right? Based on where you are um, stage-wise. And I think, and a lot of that then feeds into your access to capital, right? So if you, everyone says, oh, I'll fund you once you get your ID approval to go do your first in human. And then, you know, you realize, oh, FDA wants you to run a GLP study that, you know, costs you $150,000 and you go do that and you have great results. And then the investors say, you know what? Like, I really want to see human data. You say, okay, fine, I'm going to, you know, you talk to your advisor and say, hey, there's this great place in Colombia or in Australia or Mexico. So now I'm going to journey, you know, outside the United States and go find um, a clinical site, XUS, to start this first in human. And then, you know, you, you land some successful data, you come back to the investors and half those investors said, hey, show me some human data. They'll say, well, I want to see like 20 more patients, right? So like the, it just, it just you know, and the bar keeps moving. And I think part of that, and, and I've seen it, especially in the last, you know, four or five years, 
is that there was, you know, um, as we were in this bull run, bull cycle, there was a lot, and you have to think, as an entrepreneur, you also have to think about what the investors are dealing with. The same way that you are struggling to raise money, funds also struggle to raise money. Why? Because LPs are getting tighter with their checks, right? Whether it's family offices or pension funds or you know, um, you know, other other institutional investors, and so I think that trickles down into the reality of um, running a startup. So, yeah, and maybe you know, wanted to focus on Daniel last for this first question. You know, serial entrepreneur. You know, we we were talking specifically. You were mentioning you know the the razor's edge of success failure, uh, and a lot of times that macroeconomic. Uh, uh, Parts to the the equation can be, you know, the 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 difference between winning and losing. Um, and then maybe we want to talk a little bit about what what your experiences have been over the years with some of the companies you've been involved with, because obviously there's been some some challenges and some of the amazing successes. Yeah. So um, no greater truth. You can execute like crazy as a company, but if the macroeconomic winds are not behind you, or they're not visible in front of you, or worse. If, you, if they come from the side and completely tip your sails over, what do you do? Those are challenging moments. Um, and I've been involved in a few. This is my ninth startup I'm in right now. So I've been in involved in eight, and six of them were either acquired, went public, or both, and two didn't. And the two that didn't were due to macroeconomic-related effects. One of them was post-9-11. Uh, I was working with, um, with Leroy Hood, the um, founder of Amgen and inventor of the human genome sequencing machine, to do what is essentially 23andMe. And 9-11 happened. We couldn't raise money, so we shut down. That's brutal, right? Brutal for lots of reasons, but in this context, the economic fallout from that was sidewinds. You just went straight down. Headwinds you can see. Sidewinds you can't see. And that just blew us straight down. Um, you know, most recently, and, and one that I think a number of folks here that I recognize a lot of faces have asked me about is Avail Med Systems. You know, we raised $140 million. And we were going after a giant issue. And I still firmly believe we were right. I know we were right in what we were trying to get done. But please recognize, when you go after a big issue and you're creating markets, the time course of market creation can transcend a cycle. And when it does, 2023 is what happened with us. When it does, and your financing falls within the transcendence of that cycle, it's a sidewind. And you just go down. And that's, that's as brutal as brutal gets. We were executing like crazy we were doing well. Now, mind you, we started off and had to pivot. As John had mentioned, we've been talking about on the panel. We pivoted a commercial model. And that was the consequence of changing from one commercial lead to somebody who had a very different viewpoint in commercial. And we were able to try some new things. And we ended up with, get ready for this, $25 million in guaranteed contractual revenue and over 50 in negotiation simultaneously. And we couldn't fund. Just sit with that for a second. <laughs> That's brutal. That is brutal. It's because of a sidewind and the fact that we were heavy con heavily concentrated in a small number of customers. That second part is why the first part blew us over. And you just you have to recognize that you are, in fact, on that razor's edge. Um, most people don't recognize that Intuitive Surgical went through one of those. But it's a company today that has the highest market cap of any independent medical device company in the world. They went through one of those. Imagine if when Intuitive Surgical went public, they couldn't have gone public. Imagine if they had to stay as a private company because they went public, it shot up to 17, dropped down to two, and lived there. Now, I would imagine you all wouldn't be that interested in financing through that 18 months of, I'm not sure what we're going to be able to sell, right? So the public markets brought a lot of capital in so they could live through that, and then they pivoted from cardiac surgery to prostate surgery, and that was a consequence of a series of events that were serendipitous. But that's what then launched them, right? At Shockwave Medical, we went through the exact same thing. We had to live through a cycle. And if we did not go public in 2019, 
for those not familiar, I'm the founder of Shockwave, ran it for a number of years. If, if we did not go public in 2019, and instead, by cycle, we were going public in 2023, we wouldn't have gone. It wouldn't be a $10 billion market cap right now. Is that because we didn't execute well? Absolutely not. We were crushing it. Sidewinds, right? So it's a little brutal. Sorry. It's kind of a downer thing to say. I get it. Um, but it's not because of poor execution that things don't move forward. Very often, it is terrific execution and macro impact. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. And yeah, obviously, this, this Harsh Realities is the name of this panel. So, you know, uh, getting real is, is really important. Appreciate that perspective, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, maybe let's move to, you know, thinking about insider rounds. You're raising less cash than you want to. Or you have a cash runway and you realize that the milestone, the value inflection milestone has been moved, and you have to think about you know, winnowing down and cash conservation. And like, what do you think about and how do you advise companies, you know, what do you cut, what do you keep, what do you lean into, what do you don't? Um, you know, that's sort of this first question. If you want to talk about if for companies in revenue and whether you want to you know, you know, pump the brakes, think about path to profitability, et cetera, feel free to layer that in. But maybe we'll start with Omid and we'll work our way down. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, w when, I, when I look at investment opportunities, um, and I think most investors would agree, you typically, you want a platform technology. You want something that's going to change the world and be a platform. But you also want focus, right? And, and so when somebody says, oh, I have a platform technology, and I can do this, this, and this, and I can solve, you know, everything, you, you automatically turn off. But in reality, deep down, that's what you want because your TAM can double, triple, quadruple. But when it comes to executing in a medical device startup, you want to figure out your killer, the company's killer app. What is that killer application that nobody can live without? What is the problem you are solving that nobody else can solve? And how do you articulate that value proposition to physicians, to hospitals, to investors? And I think as a CEO, that is the number one thing that you have to do, is really know what is the value proposition of what you're doing, and then ultimately, how do you then prioritize the programs in your company, right? Because you have multiple applications always, right? You do want to um, diversify your risk across multiple disease states or applications, and then ultimately, as resources become tight, you may have to decide to cut back on certain programs, cut back on certain investments. Maybe you can't go after both neuro and coronary and peripheral, and you can, you know, you have to focus on one. And so I think rationalizing those decisions, both based on market feedback from investors, right, where you know they say, oh, that's like that's a really well. Have you thought about X, Y, or Z application? Um, taking the feedback from your clinician advisors, ultimately. Uh, and then also your existing investors, right? Because they have a stake in the business and they're there to help you and to guide you and to you know, make introductions and just help you think through these problems. Can I jump in there? Um, one of the things to be really mindful of, especially when you do have a platform technology, is um, my docs will come to you and they will say, oh, this would be really cool to use this way. I'm sorry if there are physicians in the room, they have no clue how the business of healthcare works. And so be very mindful of not going after that shiny new thing, that shiny new application, because that physician may just want to publish a paper, you know, in that particular application. Um, or they have a particular interest, it's not necessarily going to serve you well. I think the other point that I'd add on there is, you know, I mean, talked about your board and your investors. One of the things we've gone through, especially during 2023 with all of our companies, is we did an alignment check with every board. What are the expectations of the different series of investors? Um, what are the, what's the mindset around the table about the trajectory of the company? We found in several companies that one, one series of investors, they're ready to get out. They're absolutely, they're ready to sell. They don't care if we're not going to meet this next inflection point. And then others were like, no, we've got we to pony up. We've got to get cash around the table. We need to make sure we can get the company through the next inflection point. 
And that took a lot of work and strategy to make sure we could find that sweet spot of alignment. Most of the rest of the companies, there was alignment, but that's an important gut check to do with your board, especially if you're really early stage and you've only got two or three board members, making sure that you're working as a cohesive team and you're all thinking strategically aligned is, gonna, is really, really critical. I love that you did that. <laughs> that's, that's bold to do that. Um, you know, the, uh, how you position yourself, I want to key off of something you said a moment ago. Um, I'll pick back on intuitive for a moment. Um, I was the first non-technical guy at intuitive. So my job was to help Fred, um, Fred Ball set the specs on the Da Vinci. Then my job was all the downstream stuff and market creation and all the rest of that. Yes, we didn't name the company. I had to name the product. It was all this other stuff. But one of the key things he asked for is what, what's our killer app? What are we going after? Because the ultimate platform of platforms, right, arguably. Um, the one that fell out as being the most obvious was cardiac surgery. And you might think, well, gee, they're not doing much of that. That doesn't actually matter because it was financeable. OK, so that's actually why we started off there. Now, if you go back and rewind the tape, for those who are, uh, have been through a few cycles of this and know what was going on at that point, it was Heartport and cardiothoracic systems were both public. And neither one of them was doing fully thoracoscopic, between the ribs, fully thoracoscopic um, cardiac surgery. One company that could do that was Intuitive. So we sold eight systems on that and had a backlog of 13, and we went public. And the reason why it went up is because of that story, because Hartport was worth a billion or two or whatever the heck it was. And the reason it went down is because that's a terrible market for a robot. <laughs> <laughs> Right? That's just reality. It's a terrible market for a robot. You can't have that as your killer app. The pelvis makes so much more sense. Prostate surgery makes so much more sense because of all the nerves and the vessels and it's a pain to deal with and all that. And you don't have a beating heart to deal with. You don't have to decompress and you don't have to worry about decompensation from folding the heart up. And it's 1.1% of all, all surgeries for, for cardiac surgery are lima to LADs, right? Left internal memory to LADs, single vessel. That's all the robot could do to be clear, and we went public on that. That's insane, right? That is absolutely insane. But nonetheless, that's what we needed to do, right? To get, to get that uh, to ultimately go public. So I, I'd, I'd have to agree with the notion that with platforms, you have to focus. Platforms are also where your, your truest of opportunities are. Uh, at Shockwave, we were using uh, lithotripsy and angioplasty balloons. And my board is some very savvy folks. Jay Watkins and Fred Mall and Antoine Papernick. And they were looking at me saying, Daniel, you're running three companies, peripheral, coronary, and, and structural heart. Y you can't do that. And I said, OK, great. Pick which one you don't want. And they couldn't. <laughs> so I kept doing all three. Right? <laughs> That's kind of how that works. But we got a little lucky because we could borrow from one platform to the next to the next. You can't always do that. Um, so I agree with the notion of focus. And I, I think just like one point that you made, and I think you know every entrepreneur in the audience should hear, is that your job as a CEO is to tell a story that convinces the investors to come on this journey with you, right? That they're willing to reach in their pockets, put money, their time, and invest emotionally as well into what you're doing and to support you in being successful. And I think that is the key to, you know, like, as you said, is to, to fundraising and to surviving the challenges because you have other people around you, whether it's doctors or investors or advisors who are there on this journey with you because of the story that you are building and the story that you are telling. But to be clear, the story better be true. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It better be true. <laughs> yes, it better Sean, be. do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would say, you know, on the product versus platform debate, it's two sides of the same coin. And um, I think the best CEOs who raise, they, they can read the room of who sits on the other side and then pitch that story, whether it's a product or, or platform. And both can be true, right? And, and um, you know, it's, it's not deterministic where, where you had after you raised the, the money. Uh, but certainly, I think, um, you know, Axonix just sold for a couple billion, and, and I'm seeing a lot of urinary incontinence stories coming out, right? And, and a lot of them are getting funded. So, you know, are they all going to head towards that? I, I don't know, but, but certainly that's a hot spot area. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, I think on the other side of it is um, going through a couple of these now and seeing a couple, you know, already done and dusted, um, you could sort of continue to burn and reduce burn. And my retrospective look at the companies that were successful, there's a lot more cars to be turned over. It's not just, you know, I'm going to run out of money next month and then that's it. You're going to wind down. You know, the, the sort of wind down term, you know, maybe kicked around, but your investor is going to be there, at least a portion of them, and they'll support you through the next few months uh, and then you'll, you'll see the light. So um, I, I wouldn't say that it's a binary thing where, you know, you're going to run into a wall. Uh, that's, you know, if you're rational, logical, that's not going to happen and, and the investors will be behind you for that. Yeah, let me chime in if I could briefly on that because I've been asked a whole lot about Chakwe, or sorry, about Avail. Why, why didn't your, your inside investors participate? To be clear, anyone who could participate and otherwise had disposition, and those aren't necessarily a one-to-one -to, -one to your investors, they were all in. I mean, my board was humbled, humbled me, I should say, in their engagement and how much they were pushing into our story up to the last moment, pushing into our story. A good board who's truly committed will do everything they possibly can, but recognize there could be limitations in their fund that would keep them from actually doing what you want, right? Something as simple as you're able to fund on a non-priced round but a convertible note, but that particular fund is not structured to allow convertible notes to be possible. So what is otherwise your greatest friend on the board and your advocate for the last three, five, seven, 12 years, whatever it's been, might blank you because they just can't. Structurally, they cannot. So you need to recognize some of that within there, but uh, insider rounds aren't necessarily a bad thing. It's the coalition of the willing, um, <laughs> but it's, it's a belief system to carry forward because there is another card. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you turn over that card, and you just got 21. So the right investors are always going to try to help you do that. Uh, one thing on the, that I, I really want to point out on cash management is leadership. Um, you know, I've seen leaders, I've seen my, my CEOs when cash is getting tight, um, in order to get to that next inflection point, take no salary. I've also seen my CEOs um, who don't hit their quarters, hit their numbers for four quarters in a row, refuse to take a salary cut. And they're treating it like a lifestyle company when you've got investors sitting around the table that have been there ponying up time after time after time. And the CEO's response was, well, it's you guys' to, job to keep funding me, keep funding the company. And so I, I think it's, you've got to demonstrate leadership. You've got to be willing to, to make the really, really difficult decisions um, because it's not just you, it's your team. It's, and, and this company went under. I've only had three companies go under in 12 years and that one um, didn't have to. That was the arrogance of the CEO. And it was an unfortunate, talk about side win, one that none of us could have anticipated. Interesting. Yeah. So maybe maybe another pivot on onto this, but still sort of the harsh realities of, you know, you think about down rounds, recaps, you know, liquidation preferences, et cetera. So has there been sort of valuation capitulation in the market now as investors, as you are seeing this? And then, you know, sort of the add-on question is, you know, what does that mean for the founders and the and the really, you know, the, the key employees about, you know, making sure that they're still yeah, incented to, to, to be, you know, uh, great contributors for the company. I, I, I have, um, so I will say, th I guess when you think about a down round or, you know, financing, um, you're typically thinking about dilution, right? So I'm, I, you know, we had a $50 million post money, I got to raise another 10 million, but I'm getting that offered at, a 10 million pre -mine. I'm taking 50% dilution, right? If that 10 million is the difference between your company staying alive and getting the next milestone or going bankrupt, well, you could own 100% of it and it goes bankrupt, you have zero. So ultimately, I think you, as, as, a, as a founder, as a CEO, as an investor, as a board, you have to make the decision as to A, 
does this thing still have legs? And if it does, is it worth continuing forward on this journey? And let's say we get through this difficult financing cycle and we get through our clinical study or we get through our prototyping or we get through early, you know, limited market release and start launching the product. Do we think that we will be successful and therefore be able to create that value in the future? Now, the one thing I will, I will say is that as a founder who is disengaged and you know, disassociated, nobody cares about you, right? You're not involved in the business. You're not adding any value. Sure, you invented the technology. You're gone. So the people that matter for investors are who is still there. Is the team properly incentivized? Is the CEO, CFO, CTO, you know, head of commercial, head of strategy? Like, are these people incentivized and your key employees to continue to work on this journey, right? And that is incentivization by equity and the you know ESOP, um, play stock option pool, and that will always get reset. Even if you get even if you get crushed to two million dollar pre money there will be an ESOP, there will be an incentive, and people who stay on this journey will be handsomely rewarded if it's successful in the end. So I think just my view on, you know, recaps and restructures is, you know, like some of the best companies like Inspire Medical, right, as an example, they got recapped 50% before they went public at a 4x step up, and now they're a six plus billion dollar company. And so even the best companies end up going through hard times and getting, you know, a reset of valuation. And that's not, you know, it's, it can be a product of the market, right? Like just look at, look at the public markets of the last four years, COVID, you know, in March, everything dropped and everything went through the roof. You know, some things kept going through the roof, some things crashed. So you just don't know. And so some of that is cyclical. Some of that is intrinsic to the value of the company. Yeah, I'll just say one more thing. I mean, one thing to stave off a, a recap or a down round is to take your convertible notes, right? And I, I've had companies take, you know, six or seven rounds of this. And what, what the founder and clearly also the common do not realize because they don't have a voice in this is, um, uh, you know, if you build up this and add it all up with the discounts, uh, in the end, when it converts over, the common gets crushed. And your, your founder shares are just very low. So... Be aware of that. Convertible notes are good for a couple of times, but think about the waterfall as well. And usually when you have a recap and that converts too, um, it's not the recap that kills you, it's the next round that comes in. So uh, think ahead a little bit more in, in that chess move um, you know, as founders uh, and, and common shareholders too. Let me take a couple of points you just said and throw in a dose of personal experience. So when I took over Avail, it was actually a different company called New Rep. Okay, so New Rep was funded with convertible notes. And the folks involved in that thought that they owned a significant double digit percentage of the company. But they took on enough convertible notes with preferences and valuation caps and discounts. They actually owned less than 1% of the company and they didn't know it. That's a harsh reality. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I personally, as the guy coming in to build a veil off of what they built, took my own equity opportunity after a deal instead of before a deal so they didn't get crushed even further, okay? I got obliterated on taxes for it, but otherwise the founders would have been destroyed. And they had spent nine years messing around with it. I wasn't going to be part of something that destroyed them that way, so I just didn't. Um, I want to say, I want to riff on one more thing you said and then I'll shut up. Um, you had described the, the round you're in, you should be thinking about the next one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that on a bumper sticker and repeat something Jay Watkins said to me, who, for those who know Jay, he's been in the business very, very long time, he's a board member at, at Chuckwith. He said to me, the round you're raising is not the round you're raising. You're actually raising that one and the next one. Don't ever forget about the strategy around valuation has nothing to do with the valuation you're sitting in. It's the one you're setting yourself up for. Okay, so when I started Shockwave, I owned 37.5% of the company. When we went public, you could move the decimal point and divide by a number, and I'll stop there. <laughs> and I'm thrilled. Thrilled with what happened economically. Get over the notion that your equity is a digit number Get over that. The only evaluation that actually matters at the end of the day is the one at the end of the day. 
Yeah, it's it's it's, it's where you get liquid in the end, yes. right? Yes. And, and and that's it's nothing and else not matters. pricing yourself out of the market, right? And, yes, and, and, I mean, I, and I I will say like, so if you look at you know Jonathan has all the data, but most med tech startups, I mean, you hear about all these like oh, Sears sold for five hundred million dollars. And this sold for a billion dollars. Okay. Most med tech startups trade for like less than a hundred million bucks. And anything you see acquired undisclosed. They don't even do a press release. I mean, because I I did I we acquired a bunch of stuff when I was at Beckton Dickinson, and like it would never got announced, or if it did, it was undisclosed, and it was always under a hundred million bucks. And so if you do the venture math on that, work backwards that like your exit value is a hundred million dollars and work backwards, and it's gonna cost you $150 million to get there somebody's getting screwed, right? <laughs> and so the question is, who is that person? And the people who always make the money are the last round investors and the management team who's there upon exit. And that's, and that's the critical thing. And so uh, to me, it's like, as you think about this venture math and going through the machinations, right? Like you said, it's like, even if you get a decimal point, you know, at, at the end of the day, like you will be thrilled. And so it, it's a matter of getting to the exit is what's really important. And that's, that is the harsh reality, is that if you don't exit, you end up with zero. Wow, yeah. Harsh realities. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I had some more questions, but we've hit our time. Uh, I think we learned a lot. Um, really, uh, if you could join me in thanking our panelists, this was a great discussion. Thank you.